that help? Okay. Um, also, there have been just a couple questions about um, organizations that um, sent their team roster to me. Um, if they wanted to make changes or additions, really this project is internal to your organization. And as your team grows or changes, that um, isn't necessarily something you need to let me know unless you want me to forward meeting requests. Um, the most important thing is that we have that key contact information um, so that um, if there's the link to the gap analysis, those kind of things all go out to that key contact. Um, so just make sure if that changes that you let me know. But otherwise, if your team internally is is changing and growing, um, it's it's not necessarily that necessary that you update me. Happy to to have you tell me, and I love to see these multidisciplinary teams coming to life, but um, it's really not going to change how we how we function within the project. So um, otherwise, uh, thanks everybody for joining us, and I'm going to hand it off to Dawn with Capture Falls, and she and Anne are going to lead us through the next hour. Thank you, Dana. And um, hopefully everyone is seeing my my slides. So I am the part of the UNMC Capture Falls team that you guys did not meet uh, two weeks ago. I was out of town. And so um, Vicki and Ann, I think, were led that one. And uh, Vicki is also here today. And so we're going to kind of uh, share the presentation today. Uh, the goal that we want to achieve is we want to show off our website. And so we have those of you who've been involved in Capture Falls over the years are aware that we have a website that we post uh, materials on there for you to use as resources and education uh, for your team, for your staff, and so on. And over the last couple of years, uh, we have made what we think are some pretty significant improvements in that website. And um, the structure of that website is also uh, very linked to the questions that we were posing to you on the gap analysis. And so we want to take a tour with you today and kind of show you how the website is laid out, how you might be able to use it. Um, all of you are kind of starting potentially in different places in fall risk reduction. Some of you have been working on this for quite a while and have a pretty robust program. Others might be starting from scratch. Uh, there's something for everybody on the roadmap. And so that's what we wanted to kind of show you today. Um, just another uh, reminder also that the gap analysis that uh, you heard about and received um, in the email, in your email two weeks ago, um, we hope to have that information back from you today. Um, we have a pretty good response rate. We'll share with you here in a moment. Um, but that is really, that information is really going to help us create and plan for um, the educational content and, and the steps going forward in this group. And so that information is going to be basically help us tailor this um, as much as possible to the majority of you. And so that's why that information is important. Okay. So here we are, uh, session two, um, along this three month rapid cycle improvement project. So we just show the schedule again. And um, I think Dana already went over all of the housekeeping items. Um, so just a reminder to mute your lines if you, unless you want to speak up, we welcome that. Um, if anybody wants to chime in and, and share anything. Um, and otherwise, I think this is all covered. Dana, is there anything else that you need to let the group know? Um, I don't think so, unless they have questions for me, but I think I, I did mine out of turn. I didn't wait for my slide. I apologize. You're okay. <laughs> no worries at all. <laughs> Okay, here's uh, just a, a reminder of who's involved. And so again, you're meeting me today. Um, I, I, since I wasn't here, I'm not sure how Vicki um, explained my role, but um, I am a physical therapist by training. I, um, I'm on faculty now in the physical therapy education program at UNMC, and I've been part of the Capture Falls team for 10 plus years. Um, most of my career has focused on geriatric physical therapy practice and fall risk reduction, both in, in clinical practice and now um, that I have been in academics, I've been focused on research. So that's kind of my um, my what I bring to the team. And, and obviously, I, I have a mobility lens um, to falls um, as a physical therapist. That's kind of where my mind always goes. And you you met Ann and Vicki last week. And then we also have Janae, who is a, a research assistant. Um, actually, she's not an OT student anymore, right? Ann, I think she graduated um, from, from uh, the Methodist College program in Omaha, I think just this last month. So 
Okay, Anne, um, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. I believe you are gonna cover these slides. Yes, thank you, Don. Um, as Don had mentioned, um, we had to send out the initial invitation for the gap analysis on the 4th of August. And you should have just received another reminder on the 16th if um, you did not open it or if you just partially um, completed it. Um, if you have not received or someone in your uh, facility has not received the um, gap analysis, please, please, um, let us let us know. Um, we tried to hit everybody. Um, there's I think a few people that still haven't opened it yet. So if um, you have not, um, we want to get that to you. Um, we um, expect to have a hundred percent response rate in for for this gap analysis. Um, and basically, it's it's for your benefit. Um, we will take all of the responses and we're, we're going to put it into an aggregate so that we're able to better tailor our next steps uh, towards, towards the group to see um, what needs are the greatest. So we're going to be able um, to do that only if um, the majority of you get these in. Um, the response rate as of 11 a.m. today, the Don updated 52% um, complete, which is which is great. Um, and let's see, 64% are with the partial and complete. Yeah, 64 have done something, have filled out something at least. Well, if, some, not the whole, not, if not the full thing. Right, right. Okay. Um, so in that regards, we do understand that everyone is, is very, very busy. Um, so if you can get it in today, that is wonderful. We'll give you till, to end of day tomorrow before we start looking at the data and um, start doing some aggregate. We're gonna have to do some quick crunching to get it all um, available to you by the 1st of um, September. Um, again, this is its value for your hospital. Um, so please try to do your best. Um, if there's something that comes up, um, you might be a few minutes late and you want to tell us, um, so just send us a quick email and let us know um, what's going on with, with your hospital. Um, so let's see, next slides. Um, so today we are going to be covering the um, the roadmap, as Don mentioned, but first we want to know um, if you have any questions about that gap analysis. Um, you can put them in the chat, and then also we want to know what your initial reactions are. Um, you really would like to get a good feel for what areas you feel your hospital is doing well and maybe some of those areas that you feel your hospital could do better. Um, there's, um, Don, if you wanna to go to the next slide. In the, in the chat, these are those um, topic areas. If you wanna just put those in the chat for us, um, that will also really help us go when we're going through the roadmap, just to um, just give you a tour of each of those areas. So if you could do that now, that would be great. Um, we will give you just uh, a minute or two to do that. So, so this would be directed more toward the people who've done it already and have looked at the gap analysis. You would know the answers to these questions. And so, so yeah, are, are there things that, you know, you might need it and then specify it's like, oh, we feel pretty strong in this and that area, or we realize that maybe we're not as strong or weaker in X, Y, or Z if anybody wants to share, or you can unmute too, that would be fine too. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of knowing that when you go through the gap analysis, it's kind of like, so it's a learning experience. And so looking at the evidence-based processes that are covered in this um, gap analysis and kind of just reflecting on what's going on within your hospital. Um, are there any surprises or um, just some things that you feel you are, you have it under control right now. So 
looks like we have someone that was, uh, they said fall risk assessment and fall definition. So I'm not sure if, if that's something that you felt like you had a good feel for or if you were um, needed some extra help in that. Somebody else said policy is something they feel strong in, but auditing not so much because it's not consistent. Um, we've got plans for that. We're going to be covering um, how to do auditing because we felt like that was probably would be a consistent thing for everybody. Post fall assessment and huddles. We've got a couple different people um, mentioning that. Oh, and Stephanie, you heard about that. Yeah, they're strong areas. The fall. We kind of asked both questions at the same time. We so. did. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that a great strategy for pulling. <laughs> Intervention audit is a weak area. Nurses filling out the morse the same way. Yeah, reliability um, with, with uh, where you don't have people getting all sorts of different scores, getting staff buy in with post fall huddles. Yes, we've seen that before. This is great. Thank you all for um, sharing this. And it's helpful for us. And I think it's helpful for you all to know um, what your, your peers are experiencing. Someone said education. Um, it, it can be challenging on a yearly basis. Does anybody have any questions about um, the logistics, like like actually can like completing the gap analysis? Does anybody have any questions about that that we can maybe address? Because maybe somebody else is having the same the same question or the same challenge with just literally completing the gap analysis. <laughs> maybe it's just finding the time to do it, which I get. There was a note um, that was placed on the last reminder. Um, if you have started filling it out and you, and you run out of time and you need to close the survey for some reason, there's a code that you can use to get into it. Again, um, if something happens to that code, you put it on your desk and then it's, it's just gone, please don't, don't start it all over. Um, we can help you with that. We can give you that code and so that you can jump back right back in where you left off before. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to go ahead and and oh, great job. compliance with the layout post all huddles. It's great. Yeah, we'll try to as I as we give the tour of the roadmap, I'm going to try to highlight um, some of the sections where you can find some some resources to help with these these areas if it's something that you're struggling with. Okay, so um, why do we call it a roadmap? So we um, what's you know what's the rationale for the roadmap analogy? Well, it has to do with the fact that I kind of alluded to this earlier that. Um, everybody might be taking a slightly different path and starting out from a slightly different spot. Again, some of you have been working on falls for several years. Some of you we know very well, um, and you've been working uh, directly with us in the Capture Falls project. And others are, um, you know, maybe you've had some staff turnover or a change in leadership at your hospital, and so you maybe you know you're kind of trying to get going again. All of us have been dealing for the last 18 months with a pandemic. And so a lot of quality improvement, just kind of your garden variety quality improvement just had to be put on hold for a while as we all um, decided how to manage uh, patients with COVID. And so, um, you know, it'd be great to say that we are, could have that behind us and can start focusing on normal stuff again. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case, but at any rate, you're all interested in working on falls because you're here. So. Um, we had created this roadmap because we we wanted our website to be a little bit more user friendly and hopefully intuitive. Um, 
where if you know regardless of what people felt that they needed resources um, on that they could find a stop on the road um, to help them out so that's kind of the analogy of the roadmap and so i'm going to uh close the powerpoint for a second here and um so now let me just get spotlight here and i've got two monitors in my office so i'm not going to be looking at the camera anymore i'm going to be <laughs> looking well actually yeah i'll just be looking over here so that way i can continue sharing my screen so what you should be seeing now um is a copy of, is the website so and i can see you on my screen is that okay very good um so here's our little road roadmap icon and as you scroll down here um there is a little topic area. And if those of you who have completed the gap analysis should see some familiarity because these are all things that we asked you questions about, with the exception of a couple. And uh, readiness for change is something that we didn't ask about on the gap analysis because conceivably, if somebody's already doing a gap analysis, they've already kind of like made some commitment to change. Um, there might be other people in your organization who aren't quite ready for, for change. And so we're actually going to use that readiness for change as an example page um, to show you how the pages are laid out in a little bit and Vicki will share some thoughts as an as our industrial organizational psychologist about how to facilitate change um, in your organizations. Um, the other one we didn't ask about was sustainment, which is kind of the last step and because in sustaining you are trying to sustain basically everything in between. Um, so there is. Um, 14 different stops along the road that you might take. And so again, the gap analysis is really to help you identify what stops you might need to, you can just drive right on pass and which ones you need to, to stop and delve into um, just a little bit more. Okay, so that's, that is the gist of the kind of the main page of the roadmap. Okay, so let's go to, we'll go to readiness for change. So you click on learn more and it takes you to a page that looks like, like this. Let me try to make this a little bit bigger too. Um, so on each each of these pages, each of these topic pages of the roadmap, they're laid out exactly the same way. Um, we've got what, why, and how. So what what is that step? Like how is it defined? And so we have a definition of readiness for change there for you. Why is this important? A um, few sentences to explain that. And then how in general would you do it? Um, is the next paragraph. Okay. Um, from a navigation standpoint, there's this menu along the left that you could jump to another another stop along the roadmap if you if you choose from here, or you can just use I call these breadcrumbs. I'm not sure that's the right term from a web design standpoint, but you can also back up um, as you go along the road as well. Let's go back to this page. Each of these pages is also going to have um, education and tools at the bottom, and um, education so i'll click on that um, this is going to be a combination depending on the topic area there'll be either like print resources or maybe some audio visual types of resources but it's it's kind of education for your organizational wide fall risk reduction team not necessarily education for staff like the people at the bedside so this is more to educate your team members about this step and so in this example, um, we have a resource from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality that we found, um, and they have a section in their toolkit that just basically, again, does a little bit more explaining about what readiness for change is and why, you know, kind of the kind of education about the what, why, and how, um, but a, more extensive than what we had on the, the last page, okay? Then you can jump over to the, the change readiness tools, okay? For this particular step, we have quite a few um, tools listed. Again, if you scroll through here, you'll see a lot of materials from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, that's ARC. Um, all of these pages there, with education and tools, there are some things that we ourselves have created. And so like, for example, this Capture Your Falls Story flowchart created by the Capture Falls team. These are things that, that our team here at UNMC has created over the years. And so we, we highlight that, we make that available to everybody. And we've also gleaned a lot of evidence-based resources that are free and online um, and kind of sorted through a lot of the noise and found that information for you, things that are credible and, and uh, well-supported. 
um, in the research literature. And so again, very legitimate agency for healthcare research and quality. You'll see um, in the different steps, we've got resources from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Uh, there's a lot of groups out of Australia that do really good work about fall risk reduction. And so for some of the steps, we have resources from some of those Australian groups for you. And so we've done the hard work of searching the website for you for these things and then organized it based on steps along the roadmap. So that's where the information um, for this education and tools come from. Some of it's our original work. Some of it is we're linking to other resources, reputable resources for you. Okay. Um, Vicki, would you like to say anything at this point about readiness for change um, from the standpoint of you being an industrial organizational psychologist? And let me know if you need me to open any documents here. <laughs> now we're good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect, great. Um, yeah, as Don mentioned, we didn't include readiness for change in the gap analysis, um, but it is an important aspect to think about, not just for change for fall risk reduction, but really for any type of change. We could probably do a whole um, age crit cohort on just change readiness if we wanted to. Um, but a couple of tips, you know, just to think about as you're as you're preparing to, you know, make change, especially in this 90 day rapid cycle improvement project where you may be focused in on one area um, is we want to make sure people have some sort of commitment to the change. So there's actually a resolve to implement the change that's consistent amongst all the, the members of our organization. Um, but also that people feel like they have the efficacy to make the change. So we have this shared belief in our collective capability to change our behavior. Um, as I'm looking at our change readiness tools, I have um, something else I'll probably add to this, but there's a nice model for individual readiness for change that's called the ADCAR model. Um, and it stands for people's awareness about the change their desire to be a part of the change, their knowledge about the change, their ability to do so, and then the importance of reinforcement of new behaviors. Um, so that's maybe a resource we'll add here as well. But just thinking as I think about change readiness, there's certainly readiness for the organization. So do we have the time, the personnel, the resources, the support to do so? Um, but also the individual's readiness for change, the people who we, who we will be asking to make changes for us um, in our team or at the bedside. You know, do they understand the nature of the change and why it's needed? Do they feel like they want to be part of the change? And then how are we arming them with the knowledge and the ability to change practices? and then reinforcing those behaviors so that all of our effort um, can ultimately be sustained into a new way of practice or a new way of doing things. Back to you, Don. Okay, thank you, Vicki. Um, does anybody, I guess, let me just pause for a moment here and, um, you know, are there any, any comments that anybody wants to make um, relative to uh, the little bit about readiness for change that Vicki just shared. Okay, hearing none and, and seeing nothing in the chat. My next question is, um, any questions so far about the, the roadmap and, and navigation and layout? There, there are a few other little um, nuances that I want to show you, but, but in the meantime, is there anything, anything you're curious about so far? All right, hearing that and, and seeing none, then uh, let me go back to this to this page here. Um, let me go to. Several of you put something, oh, Vicki just put a direct link in the roadmap in the chat. And again, the link is available um, to you in the slides uh, because a lot of you mentioned post-fall huddles when you were uh, dropping your, your comments in the chat. We have a section for that. 
<laughs> so let me just go to that. I'll just draw your attention to that. So again, learn more. Um, we have our, our what, why, and how. And, um, you know, and again, we've got education here. We have a webinar about um, conducting effective huddles and debriefs. Um, and that one, and these, and these, we also have examples, video examples. Um, I'm not quite sure the acting is so good in these. I was one of the actresses in these videos. <laughs> but we have a, an example of a good post-fall huddle and a not so good post-fall huddle that um, we, we created here at UNMC for training. Um, these, out of all the education stuff we have, these actually might be very useful for bedside staff. I don't know, Vicki, Anne, would you agree with that, that that might be something worth, you know, if, if you wanted to beef up uh, your bedside staff's ability, or at least the people like maybe the church nurses who would maybe be the ones facilitating the huddles might be useful for them to watch this. And yes, yes def definitely, because um, just being able to see an example and just being able to kind of like follow the process and um, importantly, seeing what you can what you can glean from it what information you can get from it so when you do a post file huddle you're you're learning and the purpose is to um, reduce the chances of a repeat fall for that patient so when you get that interdisciplinary team together it is going to just give you those um, different um, perceptions of what's going on um, with the fall and as, as Don said, with those with those videos, just being able to see what's discussed in them and how you can learn is, is valuable. Mm -hmm. And the videos do show kind of what we would say would be the ideal makeup for a post fall huddle. And so, not you know more than just nursing. I and I realize, and especially with the pandemic, I think especially. Um, it's been hard to have um, interdisciplinary huddles, but to get input from pharmacy and PT or OT and nursing and the nursing assistant and the patient and family, if they were, if, if the patient's able to participate and the family was, was there, or even if they weren't there and can give insight into their, um, their loved one's um, impairments and behaviors and so on, that all of that can be very helpful. Again, that's ideal. We know that that can't happen at like 2 a.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> so um, that that's kind of an ideal makeup is what is shown in these videos. And again, you know, we've got some the, the VA is also um, very big with their with their huddle um, material. So there's that. Okay. We also have um, some other things that we have. There is a documentation form and a guide that kind of walks you through. Um, this is literally a pocket guide that people could put like in the pocket of their scrubs and, and pull out, or they could even make it to fit their um, ID badge. And so, you know, if you've got like a charge nurse, for example, or whoever's leading that huddle, um, you know, just kind of walks people through um, the, the process there. So, um, yeah, so we just, since huddle was something that every, a lot of people mentioned, uh, I just wanted to point out some of the, the tools there. Anne or Vicki, anything else about huddles that maybe is worth mentioning at, right now? No, I was just going to reiterate that, like, the, you know, the example, the good video example is the ideal you know, ideal world scenario, but we realize that's not always practical. Um, some facilities have adopted um, almost like a two-phase type huddle where whomever is available, you know, at the bedside at the time or shortly thereafter the fall, you know, conducts an initial huddle. And then later on in the next, you know, 24 to 48 hours or whatever is reasonable is able to consult with additional members of the interprofessional healthcare team to gather their, their insights and their input into the, you know, into the patient fall with the goal of making sure we're identifying issues and making changes that'll keep that patient from falling again, but also perhaps identifying problems or system practices that might need to be addressed moving forward. Um, so these are great resources to get you started. And many people have made their own 
local adaptation with these resources so that they fit your, you know, their own unique uh, context and circumstances with these tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that two-phase huddle is is something that, uh, that we know a lot of you have been adopting. And yeah, because at 2 a.m. on a Saturday or 2 a.m. Any, <laughs> any day, um, oh boy, it'd be great to get like mobility insight from, from an OT or a PT or um, medication insight from the pharmacist, but they're not there. And so, but the nurses and the nursing assistants, they need to make some changes right now for that patient. And so let's, let's figure out what we can right now to keep this patient safe, you know, from a repeat fall at this moment in time. And then, um, yeah, as soon as possible, trying to, to reach out, um, notify like rehab staff, nursing staff, physician staff, and then get, get that additional um, insight because all of us look at falls from a slightly different lens. So we all have really valuable things to add. Um, interventions was also something that I intended to kind of walk you guys through and highlight anyway, because this page is a little bit of a different animal and it also happens to be something that people mentioned um, in their chat as well. And so it starts out uh, looking very similar as everything else with the what, the why and the how and, and the education and the tools. But then um, if you continue scrolling, there are additional icons that are related either to universal intervention. So these would be things that we should be doing all, for all patients, regardless if they're identified at being at risk or not. So it's, it's kind of like almost no brainer types of things like making sure their call lights in reach and making sure they have non-slip footwear on and um, making sure that the room is uncluttered. And those would be universal interventions that we, can, we should be doing for everybody because let's face it, any of our patients could, could potentially fall. Um, at any given any given moment. But then we have patients who have very specific risk factors that put them at risk. Like maybe they have some memory impairment or maybe they have mobility impairment or the medications they're on put them at risk. And so if that's the case, then um, we have created this in a way to try to draw some direct links to whatever impairments the patient presents with, what could you potentially do for that person? Okay, so the fall risk assessments, um, regardless of which one you use, is probably asking questions about the patient's mobility, their medications, their continence, their cognitive status. You know, those are common areas that, you know, whether you use the Morse or the FRAS or, you know, whatever tool you might use, chances are the questions are, are dealing with some of these specific risk factors. And so, um, you know, and I know for policy purposes, um, people will use those scores and then put people in like a high risk category or a low risk category, or maybe you even have three. And there might be bundles of interventions that you intend to deliver if they fall into a certain risk level. Um, but we also would challenge all of you to consider whether or not, um, don't just look at the number, but also look at the items on the tool and, and use that to drive your clinical decision making. So if I check the box that, oh, this patient has mobility impairments, there are certain things that are really important um, interventions to help mitigate those mobility impairments that um, you know, other, other interventions might be overkill and not, not really necessary. So let, let's say that you've got a patient who Cognition is fine. They are well aware of their deficits, um, but they've had a total knee and they need assistance for transfers. You might not need to put a bed alarm on that person if you feel like you can trust them to not um, get up. Um, but you need to have a gate belt on and you need to have somebody with that patient when they're when they're mobilizing. And so you know, you don't want to get in the habit of like throwing the kitchen sink at everybody just because they've they've achieved a certain score on your fall risk assessment tool, but trying to be a little bit more mindful um, about what interventions you're doing, because we don't have resources. You guys, you don't have resources to do absolutely every intervention for every single patient who's identified at risk. And so that's kind of how this is is structured. Um, we even have a section for you know, if a person's at risk for falls, but also at high risk for injury, like let's say they're on anticoagulants, um, there, are, there are resources that we have on this website for situations such as that. Um, so let me, oh, let me show you this. Um, so this is under the general tools um, and getting at this idea. This is one of the tools that we created as a team 
um, this is getting at the idea of linking risk factors to um, specific, um, I'm sorry, linking interventions to specific risk factors. And so this is kind of like a one pager um, cheat sheet that, you know, if your patient has X risk factor, what are possible things that might be on the table? It's not that you would necessarily do all of these things, but like, what should you be considering um, for that patient? So that's kind of an overarching um, one pager. But going back to this main page, let me show you how some of these risk factors pages are laid out. And so this is, I'm just gonna choose the mobility impairment because I'm a PT and that's, this is, this is what I do. So if you click on uh, that page that talks about interventions um, for, to reduce fall risk for patients with difficulty with mobility or daily uh, activities of daily living, um, here we go. A little bit of a paragraph here that kind of explains, well, you know, when might this be an issue and why? And then again, a list of potential interventions. Why might these be potential interventions? And then if we have additional resources about how to actually implement those interventions, um, that you'll see that um, there'll be a link. And so that link, so again, I'm a PT, so I'm gonna click on gate and transfer belt. Um, here we go back to the, oh, education and tools uh, type of, of format again. So we've got, when there's, you know, some of these interventions are, it, it's, there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of steps to actually make it happen. Um, you either do it or you don't, but some of it, you, again, you might need a little bit more um, education about why you're doing it or um, tools about how to actually make it happen. So like gate and transfer belt, for example, on education, um, we found um, a resource from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that talks about, you know, why and how might you use a gate belt. And then um, some of our own research has shown um, that we've done here at UNMC has shown that injury risk for patients is actually reduced if you are assisting them with a gate belt and they have an assisted fall. So that's the kind of education we have. And then for tools, these are training videos that could be used as for your staff. And so there are, um, takes you to this page, mobility training videos, many of them demonstrating the use of a gate belt, one very specifically talking about gate belt usage, but then showing some examples of, of um, different transfer techniques um, using gate belts, for example. So that is kind of how those intervention pages are, are laid out. And so again, any intervention that might be relevant, again, not necessarily all of them are gonna be needed for every patient with this impairment, but that's, um, that's how these are, are laid out. Okay. All right, any, any questions about that? Otherwise, um, Vicki's going to kind of wrap things up for us. So hopefully, yeah, again, the goal with, for the website was to make it intuitive <laughs> um, where you wouldn't even necessarily require a tour, but hopefully the tour is, has um, at least um, piqued your interest a little bit in terms of maybe you might be more apt to go to the website and poke around and see what we have. Okay, and then go back to the slides. I basically talked about all of those things and all of our roadmap topics. So this is where we're at. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, one other point I wanna to make too with the roadmap is um, you'll also see some examples of um, you know, different tools, not only that we generated here at UNMC, but that um, some of our Capture Falls hospitals have created and we're willing to share as well. Um, so we, we're always looking to, I guess you could say crowdsource um, and you know highlight additional resources on our website that hospitals have adapted for their own use and have found particularly helpful and useful um, in their own facilities. So if you have specific resources that you have used or that you may create through this collaborative that you're willing um, to share, we can de-identify those and publish those on our website as well. Um, that way this can be a, it's really a collaborative effort of our own work, of existing work, and of um, 
hard work and effort that many of our Capture Falls hospitals have, have done over the years. Yeah, I would say we could de-identify it if you want it de-identified, but if you want to be identified as saying like, hey, we contributed to this, our hospital did, we can do that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that um, as well, especially as we as we move forward through this um, cohort or something you create that you're particularly proud of and want to highlight, um, just let us know and we'd be happy to do that on the website as well. Um, so to kind of bring us back to our, you know, 90 day rapid cycle improvement approach, um, today's session was a, a way to kind of get you thinking about, you know, what you're starting to learn um, from completing the gap analysis as it relates to some of the major steps um, that we see as important for integrating into your fall risk reduction program. Um, so if you bring this to our, you know, quality improvement model, we're using as a framework for this, the model for improvement. Um, we're still kind of in that first step of trying to think about, you know, what is it that we are trying to accomplish? So we're working on identifying individual hospital needs. Um, our next steps um, as, a, as a team here, we'll be looking at the collective needs of the group based on what we learned from the gap analysis um, so that we can start to identify, you know, a clear specific aim moving forward um, and then identify changes for improvement and then start to test some of those out throughout our 90 day period. So I just wanted to you know, bring us back to where we are big picture um, with the model for improvement at this point in time. So our next session is in two weeks. Um, so September 1st, I believe at noon, is that correct? Um, Ian and Don? Yep, that's what this is okay. Dana. Yes, that's what I have to. Awesome. Thanks, Dana. Um, so yep, so our next session um, will be September 1st at noon. Um, we'll review the um, kind of aggregate results of the gap analysis findings from those who have completed the gap analysis for us. Um, we're anxious to see what those look like and to see if we have some common areas of need and, and what this and also what the successes and the strengths are. Um, in fall risk reduction that exist among our cohort. Um, during that session, we will also provide some education on auditing process measures. Um, as we mentioned, as we're, as we're thinking about this as a rapid cycle improvement project, um, we wanna be able to help focus your efforts to help advance your fall program um, through something where we can make some meaningful change in a 90 day time period. Um, so auditing will be another tool we can use to help identify, you know, what our baseline is for certain processes and practices, and we can leverage that then to help set a goal for improvement during this rapid cycle improvement um, project. Um, so uh, join us on September 1st at noon. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide, Don. Um, and uh, just to kind of wrap up our session here today, so um, your action items between now and our third session on September 1st. Um, first, make sure to complete your fall risk reduction gap analysis, um, ideally by the end of the day today. As Anne mentioned, um, if you need another day tomorrow, um, you know, please take the time to make sure you can get that in. Um, so we can have as completed information as we can for the collective cohort because um, we will use that information to inform the directions that will move forward um, within our, our 90 day rapid cycle improvement project. Um, you can continue to explore the resources we have available on the Capture Falls roadmap, um, particularly those resources that are relevant to gaps you've identified in your fall risk reduction program. Um, and then as, as a way to get um, kind of get us thinking about auditing practices, because we'll cover that in our next session. Um, just start thinking about the current processes or practices you might have in place for auditing, um, fall risk reduction practices at the bedside. Um, and we'll cover some, um, you know, some best practices and some resources you can use for auditing in our session on September 1st. And I would say, so this, you know, getting the gap analysis done by, you know, today or tomorrow is 
kind of the, the deadline for us, including it in the aggregate results that we're going to be uh, presenting at the next session. If you can't get it done, we will still please do it <laughs> because the intent of the gap analysis is for you also, not just to inform us, but to also to inform you. Um, we feel strongly that you could still benefit from it as an individual hospital because it's really meant to identify, okay, what do we seem to be doing really well? What things do we seem to be doing not so well that we need to focus on? And so you as an individual hospital should still see some benefit to it, even if you don't get it done in time to be put into our data set for these purposes. All right, with that, um, here, our contact information is listed on the slide. Um, I'll turn it back over to Dana for any, any final wrap up items for our session today. Awesome. Thank you guys. That was so good. And thank you everybody who participated and chatted and those things. Um, so yes, gap analysis. If for some reason you have lost the link, don't know where to find the link, let me know. I can get in contact with the Capture Falls team and we can make sure that gets to you. Um, that is really useful to your organization to get that done and see kind of what them, where you're where you're doing well and things that we can do to help improve your fall prevention program. So I encourage you to do that. Um, hopefully within a week, we will get this recording as well as the other one both posted to the website and I will send that link out to everyone so you can share that. Um, otherwise, I think that's really all I have. Um, I do you, okay, in the chat it said, is it possible to send a confirmation that you received? Do you guys know a list of who for sure has it done and who doesn't? Oh, we, we do, Dana, and um, if you, I, I see Elaine, you were asking about that. Um, we can double check and send you an email if you're um, concerned about that. Okay. Or if you, if you want, I, if you want to send me who is done and who's not, I can do an audit and kind of send out specific emails to organizations if we want to go that route, route or if we want to wait till end of day and then kind of do that and see who are still missing, we can do that too. Um, another way to know is if uh, you did not receive <laughs> um, a reminder on Monday, um, that means that we have your completed gap analysis in. So if you did not receive it, um, but if you just did it um, yesterday or even Monday afternoon, um, uh, we can, we can confirm for you for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, anybody who was who had it complete didn't hear from us again. If you <laughs> had it only partially done or hadn't done it at all yet, that's when you got the reminder. And then the other thing is only one person from each organization got it because we only need one copy of it from each of you. Um, we don't need like five turned in for any given hospital. And so um, we sent it to, for this group, we sent it to the person that you had identified to Dana as your team lead. So Elaine, I'm not sure off the top of my head if that was you, um, but it, why don't you, if you want to drop your hospital name in the chat, if, if, if that's okay, we could, we could follow up with you directly. Yeah, we can confirm. All right. Any other questions or follow up from from you guys or hospitals or anybody else? Hey, we will see you guys all on September 1st. Um, communicate with me in the meantime, or if you want to directly communicate with the Capture Falls team, that's perfectly fine too. Um, and thank you everybody for your time. Thanks. Have a good afternoon, everybody. <laughs>